Uh, I'm so happy to be here and I want to thank you for inviting me and bringing me here to Bratislava. Uh, I wish I could address you in Slovak, but I can't. That's because I've forgotten all of it. Uh, I was in fact uh, a bit older than some of you when I left. But for some reason, I don't seem to be able to speak any Slovak, although I will tell you I do recognize some words. I'm very happy to be here to speak to you because most of you or all of you uh, study history. And as such, you probably have studied or will study World War II, uh, including the Holocaust. And you'll know something about it in terms of the historical events, of the moments that things happen, the legislation, the people, uh, the building of the crematoria and gas chambers. But I want to speak to you as an eyewitness because I saw, but not just as an eyewitness who stood afar and looked down upon this event from an ivory tower. I will speak to you as a person who actually experienced this. I was there. I got there because I was a Jew. No other reason at all. Because after all, who was I? Where did I live? Well, I was born in Slo Czechoslovakia. Remember, this country used to have two pieces to it, not so long ago. I lived in a small city, and most of you probably never heard of it. It's called Humene. It's at the eastern part of Czechoslovakia then, and now it's the eastern part of Slovakia. It was an integrated city in that when I started school, first grade, in 1935, there was a single school in the city, a public school. And there were Jews and Catholics and Protestants and the Russian Orthodox and Gypsies, all going to school together. It was the only school in town. We played together. We did homework together. On occasion, we fought, and not necessarily by religious convictions. There were no Jewish section and Catholic section and Protestant section and Russian Orthodox section in town. The small city. From end to end, you could walk at it probably about 25 minutes. The total length of the city was one and a half kilometers. That's in the longest distance. And there were ice skating rink. There was a place to swim. The river that flowed, still does I suspect, called the Laborets. So if you learn Slovak history, you should come across that river. It's not quite like a dam. And we went swimming there. And the dam is there, you get undressed, and you have the uh, ping pong table, and the volleyball court, and the uh, snack bar, of course. And we have the soccer stadium, the tennis courts. All the amenities of a small city to be used by everyone. So if you come in 1935 to Humane, you would see people, you would see businesses, and Jewish businesses and non-Jewish businesses. In capital Italian, you would see butcher shops, non -Jewish and non-Jewish. You would see taverns, businesses, even a hotel and a movie theater. It was a lovely city. And I lived totally unencumbered by anything. I knew I was a Jew because I went to synagogue on Saturday, where some of my friends went to church on Sunday. I went to religious school, Jewish religious school. They went to catechism class. But we were on the field playing soccer. It didn't matter. So I began my life in a perfectly integrated way. But unfortunately, the world is changing. Not that I knew that at age six, I was not an expert on geopolitics. Age six, seven, or eight, some of you may be, but I was not. My interest was more of soccer than international politics. But as time went on, things began to happen. Germany elected a new government in 1930. The National Socialist German Workers' Party, the election to known as the Nazi Party, came to control. And one of their major parts of ideology was racism. And in particular, the destruction of Jews. I didn't know that. By, by 1939, 
Hij moet dat ook nog niet tegen zijn hand doen. Dat is een stuk op de hand. Een stuk op persecution. Het is een very Christian back then. For instance, the very early sign of this was the fact that Jews were not allowed to go holiday. Very soon I can be recognized in this city. Well, you can think of recognizing. I look at your face. I know you have a name. Each one of us has a name. But that's not what was meant at all. At this point, the identity was I really first a yellow fan and subsequently a huge star. So that when a person saw me on the street, they no longer looked at me as a dead horse for a They go to church. And the newspaper said, Slovakia is for Slovaks. And Jews were the Slovaks. Although my family lived in this area for a few hundred years. And by 1918, when Jews were Slovakia came into being, they were all citizens. But Slovakia was all for Jews. The fact that I had a very low star, I get that. At one point, one day my father said to me, Girl, there's a job in the air. There's a sheet in my You can go over there. In fact, we have to take that sheet in my hand and take it to the police department. See, what? It's not. That's because it's true. I don't want to own or wear any gun in the chest. Fur, even if on it, I mean, no.
So now you're coming to the point when it's 1942, the Jews have lost their jobs in the way the government, the Jews have no businesses, Jewish professionals have no jobs, the country of Slovakia decides, why should we keep them? Let's get rid of them. At least most of them. Final solution to the 
Jewish questions for life. You see, you can get the Jews. But it's up to Slovakia to deliver the Jews by training to call your German But it takes a certain amount of effort to do that, kill them. Because for this you need guards, you need gas, you need something to fire the ovens. So they agreed that Slovakia will pay for every Jew that during the use of their hands approximately $125. In fact, it was 500 crowns. And so the decision was made. In the summer of 1942, on Friday night, in my city of the is enough for every Jewish home. You have 10 minutes to carry that. Now, the 2,000 Jews were in there, 1,800 I picked up that night, and gathered into the synagogue, and the doors are locked. And for the next 36 hours, 1,800 Jews of women are locked in the synagogue. Well, it's a lovely synagogue, but Normally there were 650 people there. Now you're maybe 100. Although it was a lovely synagogue, relatively new, actually, as well in the night, early, uh, late teens or early 20s, 1920s, that is. It, it didn't have a bathroom, nor did it have running water. Imagine being inside an enclosure. Imagine this room, not with 100 students. And let's say 800,000. The doors are locked. Guards outside the submachine guns. And we're stuck in here for a day and a half. And no bathrooms, no bathrooms. Work. I don't really need to paint a picture for After 36 hours, the Jews are marched out to the train station, shoved into cattle cars, boxes. The trains are locked. Never to be seen again. So what am I doing? Well, I didn't know. Because my father still was running the business for Albert. And as such, got an exemption certificate from the, uh, from the government in Bratislava, in fact. Of the 2,000, just 200 I left there. Questions. Is this temporary? And how temporary? Or is this permanent? I'll be staying there. A month goes by, suddenly more families are there. Like that. Finally, after many months, the family decides we need to do something. So, what we did essentially the whole family, my father and mother, my brother and I, and my grandparents, left Slovakia to Hungary. Now, Hungary was no heaven either. But Hungary made a decision. They can use the Jews. It's much more practical and much more beneficial. They've taken all the Jewish men, put them into a labor camp. In Hungary, and those of you who know Hungary, called Munka Tabo. And they were attached to the army, whose job, their job was to help do all the menial tasks that army had to do. Like, for instance, clean the horses. Like, for instance, build roads, fix bridges, wash the clothes, do the cooking and cleaning. Government of Mikoshko, although not necessarily a lot of Jews, decided it's much more beneficial to have these Jews do all this work. And let the army then use its manpower to fight the war against the Russians. And let the families fend for themselves. So Hungary in 1942 and 43 becomes a haven. It becomes a place that Jews are safe. They're not being shipped anywhere. The Jews of Greece are being shipped to Auschwitz. The Jews of Holland are being shipped to Auschwitz. Poland, the Lithuania, and Latvia, to them, Blinken, and Maidanik, and all the other death camps. The Jews of Hungary. And that goes to 1943. Spring of 1944. The government of Nazi Germany, together with the anti-Semites of Hungary, 
behind the final solution to the Jewish question must be implemented in Hungary. And there is a huge Jewish population, over 600,000. Essentially, my friends, by the spring of 1944, it was clear to everyone that Germany is going to be the war. It is going to be Great Britain, it's going to be France, it's going to be America and Russia. There was no way that Germany could have possibly the war. I suppose there was another war against the Jews, but that can still be won. In 53 days, 437,000 Jews were taken from their homes, into a ghetto, into a brick factory, to Auschwitz. Close to 10,000 people a day were in Auschwitz. And 90% are dead within 24 hours after arriving. And this time, I am not so lucky. No exception. So my brother and I, my grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins, in this little village called Zdaya, which is outside of Kosice, they went up and they did not I'm 14 years old. My parents are not with me. They're in Budapest. Because my father and mother went off to Budapest because my father needed the job. They don't need that many accounts in the village. How many cows can you come? And how many things? So here I am, 14 years old, in the train. The train begins to move. It stops, picks up water, and finally comes to home. Where? I have no idea. But I know it's in Poland. And the doors are swung open, and I jump off the train. And I'm afraid. Why? Because of what I see. It was evening. Against the black sky, I see flames coming out of chimneys. Guards screaming at us. Raus, mach schnell, and don't do anything with me. Four lines and begin to march. And days, after three days and three nights, cooked up in this very small place of 90 people. In a box car, the brother from the windows. And suddenly I find myself waving to the left. My brother, my grandfather, my grandmother. And they marched up to those buildings with the chimneys. Men and women are separated, they're talking about the shower. Papa Miriam, what's going to happen? They don't guess to that and they burn. The cemetery. So my brother and I, together with some cousins, off to the left. We marched a short distance into another camp and told to undress, but holding is taken away. The shape from top to bottom. We have new clothing. Striped gray and blue pants and jacket. And a hat. Marched off, standing in line, counted and counted. And by next morning, we're standing in formation and we're called to a small little table, about six people at a time, six little tables. On either side, there's a chair. On one side sits a man with something that looks like a hypodermic needle. And tells him to put my hand on the little desk. And he proceeds to give me On my own. I'm no longer pursuing it. It's no longer Irving Roth. It is not a number. 810,499. I am the property of the Third Reich. Just like a farmer knows the cattle he owns. Because I have no longer any rights to anything, including life. Anytime they want to take my life. It's very stupid. There is no crime to kill a Jew. On the contrary, it's the job. 
But I wasn't killed immediately. I went to work. I'm 14 years old and I'm assigned to work with horses. Uh, remember, I come from the city. I don't know how many of you, I would ask you to hitch a horse to a plow. How many of you could do it? Anybody? You see, I had the same problem. But I had to learn. And I did. And I worked. The food was very minimal. Black coffee for breakfast. Soup for lunch. His present. I was hungry. All the time. I was tired, extremely tired. Because the whistle blew at 3 in the morning. By the time I got to bed, it was 9 o'clock at night. But there was something else. Some nights we came back from work. And rather than being able to go directly into our building and go to sleep, get a piece of bread, go to sleep, we'll be watched by the division. Real showers. So you get undressed, march through the car door, get some soap, take a shower, come back, get dressed, which in itself was wonderful. Unfortunately, on occasion, there will be a man in uniform, a doctor usually, who will look at your name and then determine if you should take a look at it. These are called selections. The question is, will there be one tomorrow? And will I survive? I did. I survived the selections. My brother did too. And time went on. By January 1945, the Russian army was barely 15 miles away from Auschwitz. And this morning, on the 18th of January, we get out of the morning, to the gate, the guards are there, we begin to march. But we're marching in the other direction, away from the Russian army. And thus began that we were marched and we died. <coughs> but I survived that too, so did my brother. Finally, after a number of days marching in the cold winter of 1945, we were put into trains, open cars, and some more hours. And finally arrived in London, it was called Buffalo. Buffalo was a concentration camp, it was not a death camp, it did not have a gas chamber. But Buffalo didn't have much food. The food consisted of if you are lucky, a bowl of soup. Or a bowl of tea. That's probably it. You can work on your But every good man can work on your Dead or alive, dead man is on the counter. And one night, as we counted, it took a hundred people. My brother's gone. I continue standing there. It was coming to an end. It is April of 1945. And mind you, the war was over on May 8th. But the death march is coming. I kept coming. One day, to be exact, on the 10th of April, I'm hiding under a building in a crawl space. Relative me say, they won't find me. I'm hiding because I know I can't march. I can hardly drag myself. I weighed 75 pounds. The guard comes along, the dog, he finally, the dog gets under the building and begins to bark and I march to the gate. As I'm standing in front of the gate, suddenly the siren goes off. There's an area. And the area lasts on the whole boat. The commander decided not to let us go because if he lets us go, it's fine if we get killed. The guards should. Besides, if the guards get killed on the march, we'll run away. 